This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome to a new video from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth tonight. <laughs> tonight it's already eight o'clock in the evening. We have the second of April 2017, and I've come to another reading of history of the Inquisition. Finally, beginning with section three of the introduction. This section two, it was not only very hard to read. But also to me it was very hard to understand and I think that uh, I made a little mistake when I called the Arians um, believing into a man-centered gospel. I think that I mixed them up with the Armenians. Arians, Armenians, that can happen. On the other hand, it would not make that much sense for the quote-unquote Christians of the Roman Catholic Church as prophesied in Daniel to pluck up three horns with the roots if they were teaching something that was a like Arianism, a man-centered gospel, meaning playing into the hand of the Roman Catholic Church instead of uh, teaching something that goes against the Roman Catholic Church. So by this, and I know that is already some videos ago, I don't care. I just uh, admit that I probably there was wrong. But you know, um, wisdom sometimes takes time to travel from one part of your brain to another and to understand that. And like I said, this book is not very easy to understand and also uh, gets a lot of me reading and commenting as far as I can. But I'm very much looking forward to the next part because the part that we have read up to now was of the persecutions amongst Christians upon account of religion. Yeah, Amongst the persecutions amongst Christians. So that means... And that is already where I have a little bit of problem. Christians, let's 
get that straight, okay? Let's set the record here once and for all straight. Christians, in the apostolic biblical sense, meaning followers of Jesus Christ, adhering to the Bible, the written word of God alone, as guidance for their conscience, God as master of their conscience, do not persecute. That is an impossibility because if you persecute another person for his beliefs or whatever reason, you cannot call yourself a Christian. A Christian has a two-edged sword, the word of God to fight with, not a carnal sword. We despise and absolutely under all circumstances resent physical violence. No, that does not make us pussies. That makes us adhering to the word of God. I was having a Bible study yesterday and we were reading 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11 is something that I already marked here and that I took out to place into a comment when I come to that in the reading that is coming up right now. But even in the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we can read, and I think that is uh, very, very uh, profound in, in that context. In verse 4 we read, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of the Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, you know, what's he talking about? Well, I just read to you verse 4. It is reported commonly in verse 1, that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is as not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, because he is not there, but writes this to the Corinthians, have judged already, as thou were present concerning him that has done this deed. We are speaking about someone out of the midst of the Corinthians who is fornicating. Now, first and for all, we have to understand that there is a difference between fornicating and adultery. And we were speaking about that yesterday in the Bible study too. Fornicating is having sexual relationships when you are not married yourself with somebody else who also is not married. That means two people are fornicating. Adultery is when whether you or that other person is married. But any sexual relationship outside of the, I don't even want to call it holy matrimony, because I think this is a Roman Catholic saying, any sexual relationship outside a biblical ordained marriage between man and woman is, if they are not married, fornication, and if they are married, adultery, and by that a sin. And we were speaking here about fornication, that someone within the Corinthians was uh, fornicating, and in verse 5 Paul tells them to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You know, I came here to the microphone this evening to do a reading of the history of the Inquisition and not a reading of the Bible and not teaching and preaching because I am not the right person for that. I never studied the Bible, I never read the Bible in completion. Yeah? And I don't even have that understanding, but I understand that much that when I yesterday did this study, it was absolutely clear to me, and it should be absolutely clear to you too, that we are not to resort to 
any kind of physical violence against any other man for whatever he did. But as Paul says here, to deliver such an one, an adulterer, or in this case a fornicator, deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What does that mean, that the spirit may be saved? That that person will be saved and and will have life forever? No, it does not say that. But it says, and that's the way that I at least understand it. You can die in the flesh. That is left up to Satan in this verse. You can die in the spirit. But he who kills the spirit is the Lord, when you're not worthy of eternal life. That is the judgment not left us to us, left up to us, but left up to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He will wrath every wrongdoing, and fornicating is a wrongdoing. Adultery is a wrongdoing. He will do that. It's not up to us. So, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. It is not on us Christians, when we are really Christians in the sense that I explained earlier, to persecute anybody for nothing. Now you say, you're gonna, just going to do nothing? No. Put them out of your congregation. Banish them. As it was also done, and we read that multiple times, in the early, earlier readings of our uh, of history of the Inquisition, that it was stated that this and this person was banished. Meaning, set out from that place because they did not want him there. They did not want his fornication, his adultery, his blaspheming, his wrong doctrine, his false doctrine, his false teaching whatever, they did not want that there. So what you do is, put them out of the congregation. Let him leave his life elsewhere, not with you, because that's not according to the, word of, uh, according to the law of God that you live under. So in this case, because I, I have to return to the earlier readings, it was called of the persecutions amongst Christians upon account of religion. A true Bible-believing Christian does not persecute. He expels from his congregation, yeah, and says to the other person, "Go live elsewhere. Go live your life as you want, wherever you want, but not." under my jurisdiction. And because we were reading that part of that book, and I have never read that book before, like I told you, and sometimes didn't even prepare the readings, it also was for me very hard to understand, and here and there I probably didn't make a comment where it was necessary, and I understood this um, uh, uh, Arianism in, uh, in uh, Arianism I mixed it up with Armenianism and um, that's what I want to say my apologies for but most and for all I think it is very very important that we really keep in mind that as the note says here of the persecutions amongst Christians upon account of religion that is something that should have never even a book written about on the other hand the author does not always, in this book, make the distinction between Christians, and I mean Christians in the sense that I explained earlier in this video, meaning Bible following, Jesus following, only the Bible and the Bible alone following Christians, and Roman Catholics. And Roman Catholics are no Christians. And of course, they persecuted the other Christians. But when we were speaking about, as I, f I remember, for example, Queen Elizabeth, who was a Protestant queen of England, and she persecuted people in their realm, in her realm, then she was not a Christian in the biblical sense, was she? 
because how does second uh, first corinthians say that to deliver such an one unto satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the lord jesus when is the day of the lord jesus when jesus comes back and brings his judgment now That was a long introduction, but it was something that I really needed to get rid of my chest and tell you. Now we're going to continue in the introduction section still. Now section 3 of the book History of the Inquisition. And um, the undertitle of this part is Remarks upon the History of Christian Persecution. Now we are talking about the persecution of the saints. Tis a true too evident. Uh, tis a true too evident to be denied. A truth, sorry. Tis a, <laughs> already the third word I can't read. Tis a truth too evident to be denied that the clergy, and that is probably the clergy uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, <laughs> in general, throughout almost all the several ages of the quote-unquote Christian Church have been deep and warm in the measures of persecution, as though it had been a doctrine expressly inculcated in the sacred writings and recommanded by the practice of our Saviour and his Apostles. Doesn't the author in this very first sentence say the same thing that I have been saying all through my little introduction to this video? There's a truth too evident to be denied that the clergy in general throughout almost all the several ages of the Christian Church have been deep and warm in the measures of persecution, as though it had been a doctrine expressly incalculated in the sacred writings and recommended by the practice of our Saviour and his Apostles. Our Saviour Jesus Christ and his Apostles never ever recommended the practice of persecution just to name a spade a spade indeed could such a charge as it has been as it have been justly fixed on the great author of our religion or the messengers he sent into the world to propagate it i think it would have been such an evidence of its having been dictated by weak or wicked or worldly minded men as nothing could possibly have disproved. But that Christianity might be free from every imputation of this kind, God was pleased to send his Son into the world without any of the advantages of worldly riches and grandeur, and absolutely to disclaim all the prerogatives of an earthly kingdom. There is no earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ except the one that he will install when he comes. But up to then, there is no earthly kingdom. And that is what the Roman Catholic Church is all about. Building the kingdom of God here on this earth. The problem is that the God of Catholicism is not the God of the Bible. His distinguishing character was that of meek and lowly. We are talking about Jesus Christ and the methods by which he conquered and triumphed over his enemies and drew all men to him was patience and constancy even to the death. And when he sent out his apostles, he sent them out poorly furnished to all human appearance for their journey without staves or scrip or bread or money to let them know that he had but little of this world to give them, and that their whole dependence was on providence, or you could say, on faith. One thing, however, he assured them of, that they should be delivered up to the councils and scorched in the synagogues and be hated of all men for his sake. So far was he from giving them a power to persecute, that he foretold them they must suffer persecution for his name, 
This the event abundantly justified. And how amiable was their behavior under it? How greatly did they recommend the religion they taught by the methods they took to propagate it? The arms of their warfare were not carnal, but spiritual. The argument they used to convince those they preached to was the demonstration of the spirit and of power. They approved themselves as the ministers of God by much patience. They approved themselves as the ministers of God by much affliction, by necessities, by distresses, by stripes, by imprisonments, by tumults, by labors, by watchings, by fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love, unfeigned by the world of truth, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of the righteousness on the right hand and on the left hand. Oh, how unlike were they successors to them in these respects. Oh, how unlike were their successors to them in these respects. Who are the successors of the Apostles? The Roman Catholic Church hierarchy, the bishops, the cardinals and the antichrists. How unlike were their successors to them in these respects? When the Apostles approved themselves as the ministers of God by much Patience, by afflictions, necessities, distresses, stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watchings, fastings, pureness, knowledge, long-suffering, kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, and by the armor of righteousness on the right and on the left hand. How unlike were their successors to them in these respects. That's what this book is all about. How different were their methods to convince gainsayers, excommunications, suspensions, fines, banishments, imprisonments, bonds, scourges, tortures and death where the powerful arguments introduced into the church and recommended, practiced and sanctified by many of the pretended quote-unquote fathers of it. Even those whom superstition had designed by the name of saints, Athanasius, Chrysostom, Gregory, Cyril and others, grew wanton with power cruelly oppressed those who differed from them and stained most of them and stained most of them their characters with the uh, with the guilt of rapine and murder their religious quarrels were managed with such an unrelenting furious zeal as disturbed the imperial governments threw kingdoms and nations into confusion and turned the church itself into an akeldema, or field of blood. Some few there have been who some few there have been who were of a different spirit, who not only abstained from the persecuting councils and measures themselves, but with great justice and freedom censured them in others. But as to your saints and fathers, your patriarchs and bishops, your councils and synods, together with the rabble of monks, they were most of them the advisers, abettors and practices of persecution. They knew not how to, how to, brook, op, uh, how to, how to break opposition to their own opinions and power branded all doctrines different from their own with the odious name of heresy and used all their arts and influence to oppress and destroy those who presumed to maintain them. In this they did with such unanimity and constancy through a long succession of many ages as would tempt a standard by to think that a bishop or clergyman and a persecutor were the same thing, or meant the self-same individual character and office in the Christian.
Christian Church, in the Roman Catholic Church. And this they did with such unanimity and constancy through the long succession of many ages, even until today, 2017, as would tempt a standard by to think that the bishop or clergyman and the persecutor were the same thing. They are! Or at least meant the self-same individual character and office in the Christian Church. The quote-unquote Christian Church we are speaking about here is the Roman Catholic Church. The clergymen and the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church are the same thing as the persecutors. This is what the book is going to prove in the next coming, well, more than 200 pages at least. <laughs> now the author says, I am far from writing these things with any design to depreciate and blacken the Episcopal order in general. It is an office of great dignity and use according to the original design of its institution. Hallelujah! Can we read this again? The Epo Episcopal Order in general is an office of great dignity and use according to the original design of its institution, not to the misused, abused, raped version that we live through today under the name of the Roman Catholic Church. It was an office of great dignity and use according to the original design of its institution. But when that design is forgotten, or when that design is wholly perverted, when instead of becoming overseers, which is the other word to use for bishop, when instead of becoming overseers of the flock of Christ, the bishops tear and devour it and proudly usurp dominion over the consciences of Christians when they ought to be content with the helpers of their joy. I know no reason why the name should be complimented or the character held sacred when it is abused to intolerance, oppression and tyranny, or why the venerable names of quote-unquote fathers and saints should screen the vices of the bishops of former ages who, notwithstanding their writing in behalf of Christianity and Orthodoxy, brought some of them the greatest disgrace on the Christian religion by their wicked practices and exposed it to the severest satires of its professed enemies. And for the truth of this, I appeal to the foregoing history. Now, we will continue in a moment. <clears throat> but I want to go back to the beginning of this paragraph, where it says, But when that design is forgotten or wholly perverted, when instead of becoming overseers of the flock of Christ, the bishops tear and devour it. This is what Jesus warned about. Wolves in sheep clothing. Wolves in sheep clothing. Clothe, yes, in the fur of a sheep the wolves appear unto you, brethren, in the church. And because they look like you and pretend to speak like you, you think they are like you. The overseers, the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church are wolves in sheep clothing. And they tear down the belief systems of true Bible-believing Christians and devour it. They usurp dominion over the consciences of Christians. That is what the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Satan, is all about. And I like it very much that the author goes into this here and really writes this. Instead of becoming overseers of the flock of Christ, the bishops tear and devour it. But I thought a little explanation to the sentence would be appreciated. If any observations on their conduct, he continues, should affect the temper and principles of any now living, they themselves only are answerable for it. 
and welcome to make what use and application of them they please. Sure I am that the representing them in, uh, in their light Sure I am that the representing them in their true light reflects an honor upon those reverent and worthy prelates who maintain that moderation and humility which is essential to the true dignity of an episcopal character and who use no other methods of conviction and persuasion but those truly apostolical ones of found reasoning and exemplary piety. May God grant a great increase and a continual succession of them in the Christian Church. And those are the people that you can look for like a needle in a haystack nowadays. People who adhere to the Bible, as the author says, other methods of conviction and persuasion, but those truly apostolical ones. What are the apostolical methods of conviction and persuasion what are these teaching the word of god go out and preach the gospel to every creature that are the true apostolical methods of conviction and persuasion and nothing else Now on the bottom of the page we continue, but as the truth of history is not to be concealed, and as it can do no service to the Christian cause to palliate the faults of any set of Christians whatsoever, especially when all parties have been more or less involved in the same guilt, I must observe farther as an aggravation of this guilt that the things for which Christians have persecuted each other have been generally met as of no importance in religion, and oftentimes such as have been directly contrary to the nature of it. If my reader would know upon what accounts the Church hath been filled with divisions and schisms, with excommunications and anathemas have been so dreadfully tossed about, what hath given occasion to such a multitude of suspensions, depositions and expulsions, what hath excited the clergy so uh, to such numberless violences, to such numberless rapines, cruelties and murders, he will probably be surprised to be informed that is nothing of any consequence or real importance, nothing relating to the substance of uh, and life of pure and undefiled religion. Little besides hard words, technical terms, and inexplicable phrases. Inexplicable phrases. We're going to go back to that a little later. Points of mere speculation, abstruse questions and metaphysical notions. Rites and ceremonies. Forms of human invention. And certain institutions that have had their rise and foundation only in superstition. Well, inexplicable phrases, that is, casuistry and sophistry as masterly used by the Jesuit order, yeah? that have had their rise and foundation only in superstition. Yeah, why is superstition such an important word here? Because the Roman Catholic religion is an idolatrous and superstitious religion. So you see where the author, without speaking about this, is actually talking about here. These have been the greatest engines of division. These the sad occasions of persecution. Would it not excite sometimes laughter? And uh, and, and, and sometimes even indignation to read of a proud and imperious prelate excommunicating the whole Christian church and sending by wholesale to the devil all who did not agree with him in the precise day of observing Easter? Especially when there is so far from being any direction given by Christ or his apostles about the day that there is not a single word about the festival itself in the Bible. And it is not 
And is it not an amazing instance of stupidity and superstition that such a paltry and whimsical controversy should actually engage for many years the whole Christian world and be debated with as much warmth and eagerness as if all the interests of the present and the future state had been at stake? As if Christ himself had been to be crucified afresh and his whole gospel to be subverted and destroyed. We were speaking earlier about the identification of the days of Easter in, this, in the reading of this book. The King James uses the word Easter only once. And there are many people who attack the King James for that and say, Ah, you see, the King James is using pagan word, pagan feasts. Yeah, of course, because the King James wanted to make a point that when Peter was put into prison and Herod wanted to have his go after him, he first had to observe his pagan feast of Feaster. He had to go fornicate, because that's what the Feast of Easter is all about. You know, it's a fertility feast, right? It has nothing to do with the crucifixion and um, rising of our Lord Jesus Christ three days later nothing to do with that. That is called the Passover. But in the King James Bible the word Easter is used especially for that reason, to point out that Herod was a keeper of the pagan feast of Easter. And as I said, it is today the 2nd of April and within a fortnight we have this Easter feast today here, which the Roman Catholic Church says these are holidays, or holy days, while nobody can make anything holy on this earth except he who is holy, and he is not on this earth, only his spirit is. That's our Father in Heaven, by the way, by the way, for the case you didn't understand that. Only he can make things holy because he is holy. But this whole discussion about this, which precise day observing Easter, and the point that the author makes here is very important. It is not even mentioned in the Bible once about this feast. No, but what is mentioned in the Bible is the feast of unleavened bread. I think I read that yesterday in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, let's see. Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. We are speaking about the Passover feast. I will even go back to verse 6 to make the point very clear. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Which feast is he talking about? The feast of unleavened bread, that preceded the feast of the Passover. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let me ask you one question. When Christ did away with all the feast days, why does Paul suggest, clearly after the time that Jesus ascended into heaven, why does Paul suggest, therefore let us keep the feast? The feast of, of unleavened bread is surely a feast to be remembered and kept even in our time. Whether you like it or you not, I don't care. But I see what Paul writes here in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5. You see, and this is what I call the spirit working. When yesterday on the Sabbath 
I've had a Bible study with my brothers Brett Norman and Tom Fress, and we were speaking for two and a half hours and reading 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the next day I sit down to do a reading of the book The History of the Inquisition. And I can use already now twice, and I know once more, because once I prepared the same reading we went through yesterday. This is what I call getting an understanding of the Bible by reading other books and putting that understanding of the Bible into the other books to make an explanation for that. I hope you can follow what I've just explained to you. Now, as if Christ himself had been crucified afresh and his whole gospel to be subverted and destroyed. The feast of Easter is not a feast we should remember. It's a heathen feast. But the feast of unleavened bread is something that we should remember. And on which day? Why are they... A, 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 quarreling about the day of that feast? Jesus died on a certain day. Like probably one of your family died one of a certain day. And you always remember the day, like you remember your birthday, right? When you're born on the 30th of October, you know I celebrate my birthday on the 30th of October. I personally don't celebrate my birthday because it's not in the Bible. The only two times in the Bible a birthday is celebrated, heathens celebrated it. So I don't celebrate my birthday. I am born again every morning when I wake up and the Lord brought me safely through the night. That's my birthday. Every day again. In the Lord. But my father died on the 21st of November. That's every day the same. Every year the same. So I don't have to remember the day because that day will come. That date will come. What is their problem here of observing Easter? Because they changed it every year. Like I said, this year Easter is in the weekend of the 13, 14, 15 something of April. And quite quote unquote late as many people say. Because often it's already in the month March. Yes. But that's the practice of an idolatrous and superstitious religion. And when you are in a quote-unquote church where people do not agree with, uh, with the bishop of the church of the days of observing Easter, you should not go out of the church. Run! Take your legs and run far away. When you're in a church that observes Easter, when you're in a church that, obs church that observes Christmas, Christ Mass, run! Now the author goes, the author goes into the Arian controversy, and that's why I made my apology for my misunderstanding of that by saying that the Arians were uh, a man-centered gospel. The Arian controversy that made such havoc in the Christian Church was, if I may be allowed to speak it with uh, to speak it without offence, in the beginning only about words, though probably some of Arius his party went farther than afterwards than Arius himself did at first. Arius, as has been shown, expressly allowed the sun to be before all times and age, perfect God unchangeable and begotten after the most perfect likeness of the unbegotten Father. Now, I haven't read it in this clear words all through this book before. I have not. And that's why when I read that today, I understood that I made a mistake when I called the Arians people of a man-centered gospel, which I mixed up with Arianism, which is a man-centered gospel, but that is something else, something we don't even talk about tonight. 
areas as has been shown expressly allowed the sun to be before all times and ages perfect god unchangeable and begotten after the most perfect likeness of the unbegotten father as far as i understand the bible the writing the word of god i can agree with arius here and i understand that therefore he was persecuted because that is not what the different councils that we are going to read about in the coming minutes we're speaking about this is not what the roman catholic church quote unquote agreed on but arius has shown or has has been shown expressly allowed the sun to be before all times and ages perfect god unchangeable and begotten after the most perfect likeness of the unbegotten father i sign to that the author continues now this to me appears to bid a very fair for orthodoxy and was i think enough to have reconciled the bishops and his presbyter if there had not been some other reasons of the animosity between them but when other terms were invented that's the problem they do not adhere to the bible but they invent their own speech they invent own words to explain their superstitious thinking but when other terms were invented that were hard to be understood <laughs> like i also had my problems with that and a problem i guess you have too and difficult to be explained the original controversy ceased and the dispute then was about the meaning of those terms and the fitness of their use in explaining the divinity of the son of god do you know what i adhere always to when i cannot explain something that is in the bible i just believe it the way that god wrote it i am not as smart as god i cannot understand all his ways his doings and not doings and the, so first of all i have to humble myself and understand that, that i cannot understand everything i am caught in the system which has this four dimensions among it is time and i cannot even imagine what it would be to live in a realm outside of time but that's where god lives that's how he could create everything you cannot create anything when you are in it you only can create anything when you're out of it god is not submitted to time as arius here said jesus was not submitted before time because before all times and ages because he was outside perfect god unchangeable and begotten of the father the most likeness of the unbegotten father and that's the problem with quote unquote religion they use terms they even invent terms to make understand things that they cannot possibly understand instead of inventing terms to try to teach someone something just say i cannot explain it in other words than it is written in the holy writ and therefore you just have to commit yourself to faith humble yourself to faith and when you humble yourself to faith and you submit your conscience to the holy spirit the holy spirit will guide you into all truth and will sooner or later show you and you will gain wisdom by the studying of the word of god so but when other terms were invented that were hard to be understood and difficult to be explained the original controversy even ceased and the dispute then was about the meaning of those terms so we are discussing about sophistry and casuistry and the fitness of their use in explaining the divinity of the son of god arius knew not how to reconcile the bishop's words 
ever begotten, with the assertion that the Son coexists unbegottenly with God, and thought it little less than a contradiction to affirm that he was unbegottenly begotten, whatever that means. Here already begins a little bit of casuistry within the book. And as to the word consubstantial, Arius seems to have thought that it destroyed the personal substance of the Son and brought the doctrine of the Sibelius, of Sibelius, or else that it implied that the Son was a part of the Father, and for this reason declined the use of it. And, indeed, it doth not appear to me that the Council of Nice, of Nicaea, as you probably better know it better, it doth not appear to me that the Council of Nicaea had themselves any determinate and fixed meaning to the word, as I think may be fairly inferred from the debates of that council with Eusebius, bishop of Caesarea, about that term, which, though put into their creed, in opposition to the Arians, was yet explained by them in such a sense as almost any Arian could have bona fide subscribed to. On the other hand, the bishop of, the Alex uh, of Alexandria seems to have thought that when Arius asserted that the Son existed by the will and counsel of the Father, it implied the mutability of his nature, and that when he taught concerning the Son, there was a time when he was not, it inferred his being a temporary and not an eternal being, though Arius expressly denied both of these consequences. In short, it was a controversy upon this metaphysical question, whether or no God could generate or produce a being in strictness of speech as eternal as himself, or whether God's generating the Son doth not necessarily imply the pre-existence of the Father, neither in conception or some small imaginable point of time, as Arius imagined. And the bishop denied. This was, in fact, the state of this controversy. And did not the Emperor Constantine give a just character of this debate, when he declared the occasion of the difference to be very trifling, and that their quarrels arose from an idle itch of disputation, since they did not contend about any essential doctrine of the gospel? Could these hard words and inexplicable, inexplicable points justify the clergy in their intemperate zeal, and in their treating each other with the rancour and bitterness of the most implacable enemies? What hath the doctrine of real godliness, what has the Church of God to do with these debates? Nothing! The Church of God accepts the word of God as it is written. There is not to be made any change. There is not to be added to the word, there is not to be taken away from the word. And if you do so, you will feel the wrath of God and your life, is, your name is not written in the book of life. What hath the doctrine of real godliness, what hath the church of Jesus Christ to do with these debates? Nothing! So come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of, a thin, of her sins. Revelation 18, verse 4. And that you receive not of her plagues, because God hath remembered her iniquities. What hath the doctrines of real godliness, what hath the church of God to do with these debates? Nothing. Come out of her. Has the salvation of men's souls and the practice of virtue any dependence upon men's receiving unscriptural words in which they cannot believe because they cannot understand them and which those who first introduced them were not able to explain? Hello! 
Why were there these dispersions amongst the people, the clergymen, the bishops, in the councils? Because they were using fancy words they couldn't even explain themselves. So anybody who did not adhere to their explanation that they even didn't understand, they persecuted. Has the salvation of mint souls and the practice of virtue any dependence upon mints receiving unscriptural words in which they cannot believe because they cannot understand them and which those who first introduced them were not able to explain? If I know my own heart, I would be far from giving up any plain and important doctrine of the gospel. But will any man coolly and soberly affirm that, ne that nice and intricate questions that deepened upon metaphysical distinctions and run so high as the most minute supposable atom or point of time can be either plain or important doctrines of the gospel? Oh, Jesus! If thou be the Son of the everlasting God, the brightness of the Father's glory, and the express image of his person, if thou art the most perfect resemblance of, all, of his all-perfect goodness, that kind benefactor, that godlike friend to the human race, which the faithful records of thy life declare thee to be, how can I believe the essential doctrines of thy gospel to be thus wrapped up in darkness, or that the salvation of that church which thou hast purchased with thy blood depends on such mysterious and inexplicable conditions. If thy gospel represents thee right, surely thou must be better pleased with the humble, peaceable Christian who, when honestly searching into the glories of thy nature, and willing to give thee all the adoration thy great father has ordered him to pay thee, falls into some errors as the consequence of human weakness. Then with that imperious and tyrannical discipline who divides thy members, tears the bowels of thy church, and spreads confusion and strife throughout thy followers and friends, even for the sake of truths that lie remote from men's understanding, and in which thou hast not thought proper to make the full, the plain decision. If truth is not to be given up for the sake of peace, I am sure peace is not to be sacrificed for the sake of such truths. And if the gospel is a rule worthy our regard, the clergy of those times can never be excused for the contentions they raised and the miseries they occasioned in the Christian world upon account of them. Now, this was quite intense. And I got to say what really was on my mind. I hope that you enjoyed my reading and explanation of the book History of the Inquisition. In this part, the starting of section 3 of the introduction, that deals with another chapter now, namely Remarks upon the History of Christian Persecution. We have read now oh, about four pages, 93 to 97, but the hour is done and um, I don't want to prolong your attention span more than necessary and mine also. So the other quotation from Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 5 that I prepared uh, is something that comes a little bit later in the reading that I prepared a little bit by reading once a little bit through it. Uh, so that is for next time. So then up to this, Jogna 66 signing off says, thank you for watching and listening. God bless you and until next time. Bye bye.